Hi there, I'm Gideon Rose, and welcome to another episode of Foreign Affairs Focus. We have the pleasure of being here today with Micah Zenko, one of the co-authors of an article in our last issue, Clear and Present Safety, The United States is More Secure Than Washington Thinks. So Micah, the gist of your piece is that there's a lot of threat inflation going around and a lot of talk about the terrible dangers of the world, but that in fact, that's not true. I mean, the United States is actually in a very good position. Explain what you mean by that and why. Well, if you look at some common metrics for how you would gauge that how uh, threatened the United States is, and you look at the specific threats that people mention, like cyber attacks, China, Iran, rogue states, nuclear weapons, and so forth, the United States has really never been more secure and more secure in its interests and more of a sort of dominant hegemonic power at any time in history. Uh, the United, if you look at, just take Iran for example, Iran is not developing a nuclear weapon according to the intelligence agencies. The United States has 2,000 deployable nuclear weapons it could put on Iran tomorrow. China also is modernizing uh, its military as sort of any rising great power does, but it really cannot contest the United States militarily anywhere in the world. Um, there's never been a cyber attack on the United States that killed a human being, for example, and most things that we see as cyber attacks are actually instances of, uh, 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 of uh, sort of cyber exploitation by hackers and so forth. It's not state-directed attacks and so forth. So if you look at the specific threats that people claim should justify, for example, $600 billion on military spending, 1.6 million people uh, in just the civilian side of the military, it doesn't really hold up. Uh, and so, but that sort of threat inflation is uh, a common practice by both Republicans and Democrats, people at think tanks, people at universities, policymakers in general, uh, because it paints a world in which sort of militarized responses and a robust uh, defense spending and a robust U.S. presence in the world is necessary, but that's just not the world we face. But aren't the Iranians religious fanatics who might actually use a bomb? Aren't there a billion Chinese who are soon going to take over the world economy? How can you be so calm and when everybody else is so hyped up? Because of what the United States has, right? The United States has 2,200 nuclear weapons, plus or minus, we could put on China tomorrow. China could put 72 nuclear weapons on the United States. Uh, that sort of deterrable capability is very robust and, 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 uh, and specific. Uh, the United States is never going to be invulnerable to specific terrorist attacks or lone wolves or even acts by states, but nobody has either the interest or the military capacity to take on the United States really anywhere where they challenge its interest. To take the China example specifically, China, or I'm sorry, the Iran example specifically, Iran has threatened to close the Straits of Hormuz. They've, they've threatened it every once in a while. They've done it almost every year since 1979, uh, and they've never successfully done that. And recently they said if, an, if a U.S. carrier goes through the Straits of Hormuz again, uh, they won't allow it. And a U.S. carrier went through and nothing happened. And in fact, the U.S. Navy and the Iranian Navy actually have a very professional relationship. Um, so we should look at what these countries actually are capable of doing and what their intentions behind that are. Um, and what they sort of project as rhetoric. And you, sifting through that and doing a common sense net assessment of what threatens the United States should tell us that we're actually very secure. So if you're right, why is everybody else exaggerating the dangers? Is it because they're stupid or because they're paranoid or because they want something else that uh, threat inflation gives them? What? It's so, so for some people, it's tr strictly in their material interests, right? If you work at a think tank, nobody gives you funding to study why the world is safe. Right. If you have, as I do, like a preventive mindset for things, you know, no one's ever held held a race for. Uh, there's always a race to prevent, uh, a race for the cure. There's never a race to prevent the cause. Right. Nobody thinks with a preventive mindset. No one. It's in no one's sort of interest to, to to see things that way. And then Republicans and Democrats. Republicans can always beat up Democrats for being weak, and the Democratic response to that is to always appear stronger. Uh, and to do that, they have to pretend that the world is very dangerous, pretend that there are many, many, as I call it, the threat smorgasbord of threats that the, that the United States faces, some are which are specific, some are which are very generalized. Uh, and so it's their political interest to do so as well. And then for the military specifically, you know, there's no other reason to justify spending $600 billion. Okay, so let's say you know, in November the newly elected president or re-elected president uh, asks you in to uh, his office and says, I read your piece, I buy it. Uh, what is, are the practical implications for American foreign and defense policy from this? You're now my chief czar 
Uh, if you're right, what should we be doing differently to reflect these more benign conditions that uh, you're describing? Well, I like to call them challenges and not threats. And let's think specifically about these challenges and what we can do to sort of mitigate them and, and reverse them. These are things like climate change, pandemic, uh, 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 pandemic influenzas, global health issues, uh, uh, transnational crime, none of which the United States can deal with unilaterally, and none of which has a military response, right? Everything requires civilian intelligence, police cooperation. Everything requires us building up our capacity in that, and it specifically requires working with other people. Uh, but if you have sort of a huge hammer and you can have the agency to act proactively and to do something, you know, as I always say, nothing is more impressive and responsive than military force. And that's why when there's a challenge that the United States faces, rather than dealing with underlying causes, working with allies, working with partners, we tend to respond militarily. So I would say readjust your priorities. You know, there's a reason we have 30,000 people in the uh, State Department and 1.6 million in the Pentagon. And that's because we see things through a militarized lens. And I would readjust those priorities on day one. So if we adopt your squishy potential, you know, perspective, we uh, boost our civilian uh, foreign policy uh, and international capacity while uh, cutting back our military? Well, there's a lot. I mean, even if you look at the military cuts that are being projected over the next 10 years, the United States will still have you know, 1,600 nuclear weapons, it will still have 470,000 members of the Army, it will still have 285 Navy ships. If you just implemented the cuts that the Pentagon has projected, over 487 billion over the next 10 years, uh, that would be a start. But even this current fiscal year, the Obama administration is trying to cut $6 billion, which is 1% of defense spending, and it doesn't look like it's going to happen, right? You can't even get 1% cut. The size of the military has doubled since 9-11, Homeland Security spending has tripled. Intelligence spending has almost more than tripled. You know, the architecture that was created as a response of 9-11, where Al-Qaeda killed 3,000 people and were tragically lucky in this terrorist attack, uh, has sort of cemented itself. And now the sort of uh, uh, influences that and, and the people that are invested in this system have made it stick into place. But unless there's a president who is willing to have the leadership and make the commitment to roll this back, uh, we're going to be stuck with an over... Uh, oversized military, undersized civilian diplomatic corps. What has been the reaction to this uh, this publication of these outrageous views that basically say everything is way overinflated? Surprisingly, they've been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, I think people recognize threat inflation when they hear it. They recognize that it's for generally material or political advantage for people to say this, but it doesn't reflect the world that the United States faces. And so sort of unfortunately for creating controversy and, and a fight with public figures, people have been overwhelmingly supportive and positive. Well, on that note, Mike Kazenko, thank you very much. Thank you, Gideon. We look forward to another, ex another exploration uh, in our next Foreign Affairs Focus.